Chapter 17 Creative Art He went forth seeking. The Schofield household was catless this winter, but there was a nice white cat at the Williams. Penrod strolled thoughtfully over to the Williams's yard. He was entirely successful, not even having been seen by the sensitive woman, aged fifty-three years and four months. But still, Penrod was thoughtful. The artist within him was unsatisfied with his materials, and upon his return to the stable, he placed the cat beneath an overturned box and once more sat down in the inspiring wheelbarrow, pondering. His expression, concentrated and yet a little anxious, was like that of a painter at work upon a portrait that may or may not turn out to be a masterpiece. The cat did not disturb him by her purring, though she was indeed already purring. She was one of those cosy, youngish cats, plump, even a little full-bodied perhaps, and rather conscious of the figure, that are entirely conventional and domestic by nature, and will set up a ladylike housekeeping anywhere without making a fuss about it. If there be a fault in these cats, overcomplacency might be the name for it. They err a shade too sure of themselves, and their assumption that the world means to treat them respectfully has just a little taint of the grand dame. Consequently, they are liable to great outbreaks of nervous energy from within, engendered by the extreme surprises that life sometimes holds in store for them. They lack the pessimistic imagination. Mrs. Williams's cat was content upon a strange floor and in the confining enclosure of a strange box. She purred for a time, then trustfully fell asleep. "'Twas well she slumbered. She would need all her powers presently. She slumbered, and dreamed not that she would wake to mingle with events that were to alter her serene disposition radically and cause her to become hasty-tempered and abnormally suspicious for the rest of her life. Meanwhile, Penrod appeared to reach a doubtful solution of his problem. His expression was still somewhat clouded, as he brought from the storeroom of the stable a small fragment of a broken mirror, two paintbrushes and two old cans, one containing black paint and the other white. He regarded himself earnestly in the mirror. Then, with some reluctance, he dipped a brush into one of the cans and slowly painted his nose a midnight black. He was on the point of spreading this decoration to cover the lower part of his face when he paused, brush halfway between can and chin. What arrested him was a sound from the alley, a sound of drumming upon tin. The eyes of Penrod became significant of rushing thoughts, his expression cleared and brightened. He ran to the alley doors and flung them open. Oh, vermin! he shouted. Marching up and down before the cottage across the alley, Vermin plainly considered himself to be an army. Hanging from his shoulders by a string was an old tin washbasin, whereon he beat cheerily with two dry bones, once the chief support of a chicken. Thus he assuaged his ennui. Vermin, come on in here, Penrod called. I got something for you to do. You'll like awful well. Vermin halted ceased to drum and stared. His gaze was not fixed particularly upon Penrod's nose, however, and neither now nor later did he make any remark or gesture referring to this casual eccentricity. He expected things like that upon Penrod or Sam Williams, and as for Penrod himself, he had already forgotten that his nose was painted. Come on, Vermin. Vermin continued to stare, not moving. He had received such invitations before, and they had not always resulted to his advantage. Within that stable things had happened to him, the like of which he was anxious to avoid in the future. "'Oh, come ahead, vermin,' Penrod urged, and divining logic in the reluctance confronting him, he added, "'This ain't going to be anything like last time, vermin. I got something just splendid for you to do.' Vermin's expression hardened. He shook his head decisively. Mo, he said. Oh, come on, vermin, Penrod pleaded. It isn't anything going to hurt you, is it? I tell you, it's something you'd give a good deal to get to do if you knew what it is. Mo, 
said Vermin firmly. I mow ma woo. Penrod offered arguments. Look, Vermin, he said. Listen here a minute, can't you? How do you know you don't want to until you know what it is? A person can't know they don't want to do a thing even before the other person tells them what they're going to get them to do, can they? For all you know, this thing I'm going to get you to do might be something you wouldn't miss doing for anything there is. For all you know, Vermin, it might be something like this. Well, for instance, suppose I was standing here, and you were over there, sort of like the way you are now, and I says, Hello, Vermin, and then I'd go on and tell you there was something I was going to get you to do. And you'd say you wouldn't do it, even before you heard what it was, why would be any sense to that? For all you know, I might have been going to get you to eat a five-cent bag of peanuts. Vermin had listened obdurately until he heard the last few words, but as they fell upon his ear he relaxed and advanced to the stable doors, smiling and extending his open right hand. Are oh, we? Oui, he said. I'm here. Well, Penrod returned, a trifle embarrassed. I didn't say it was peanuts, did I? Honest vermin, it's something you'll like better than a few old peanuts that most of them probably have worms in them anyway. All I want you to do is... But Vermin was not favorably impressed. His face hardened again. Mo, he said and prepared to depart. Look here, Vermin, Penrod urged. It isn't going to hurt you just to come in here and see what I got for you, is it? You can do that much, can't you? Surely such an appeal must have appeared reasonable, even to Vermin, especially since its effect was aided by the promising words, See what I got for you. Certainly Vermin yielded to it, though perhaps a little suspiciously. He advanced a few cautious steps into the stable. Look, Penrod cried, and he ran to the stuffed and linked stockings, seized the leading string, and vigorously illustrated his further remarks. How's that for a big, long, ugly-faced, horrible, black old snake, Vermin? Look at her follow me all round anywhere I feel like going. Look at her wiggle, will you, though? Look how I make her do anything I tell her to. Lay down, you old snake, you. See her lay down when I tell her to, Vermin. Wiggle, you old snake, you. See her wiggle, Vermin. Hi. Undoubtedly, Vermin felt some pleasure. Now listen, Vermin, Penrod continued, hastening to make the most of the opportunity. Listen. I fixed up this good old snake just for you. I'm going to give her to you. Hi. On account of a previous experience not unconnected with cats and likely to prejudice vermin, Penrod decided to postpone mentioning Mrs. Williams's pet until he should have secured vermin's cooperation in the enterprise irretrievably. All you got to do, he went on, is to chase this good old snake around and sort of laugh and keep poking it with the handle of that rake yonder. I'm going to saw it off, just so's you can poke your good old snake with it, Vermin. Oh, why, said Vermin, and extending his open hand again, he uttered a hopeful request. Peem up? His host perceived that Vermin had misunderstood him. Peanuts, he exclaimed. My goodness, I didn't say I had any peanuts, did I? I only said... Suppose, for instance, I did have some. My goodness, you don't expect me to go round here all day working like a dog to make a good old snake for you and then give you a bag of peanuts to hire you to play with it, do you, Vermin? My goodness. Vermin's hand fell with a little disappointment. Oh, why, he said, consenting to accept the snake without the bonus. That's the boy. Now we're all right, Vermin, and pretty soon I'm going to saw that rake handle off for you too, so's you can kind of guide your good old snake around with it. But first, well, first there's just one more thing's got to be done. I'll show you. It won't take but a minute. Then, while Vermin watched him wonderingly, he went to the can of white paint and dipped a brush therein. It won't get on your clothes much or anything, Vermin, he explained. I only just got to... But as he approached, dripping brush in hand, the wondering look was all gone from vermin. Determination took its place. Mow! He said, turned his back, and started for outdoors. Look here, vermin! Penrod cried. I haven't done anything to you yet, have I? It isn't going to hurt you, is it? 
You act like a little teeny bit of paint was going to kill you. What's the matter of you? I only just got to paint the top part of your face. I'm not going to touch the other part of it, nor your hands or anything. All I want... M.O., said Vermin from the doorway. Oh, my goodness, moaned Penrod, and in desperation he drew forth from his pocket his entire fortune. All right, Vermin, he said resignedly. If you won't do it any other way, here's a nickel, and you can go and buy you some peanuts when we get through. But if I give you this money, you've got to promise to wait till we are through, and you've got to promise to do anything I tell you to. You going to promise? The eyes of Vermin glistened. He returned, gave bond, and grasping the coin, burst into the rich laughter of a gourmand. Penrod immediately painted him dead white above the eyes, all round his head and including his hair. It took all the paint in the can. Then the artist mentioned the presence of Mrs. Williams's cat, explained in full his ideas concerning the docile animal and the long black snake, and Della and her friend, Mrs. Cullen, while Vermin listened with anxiety but remained true to his oath. They removed the stocking at the end of the long black snake and cut four holes in the foot and ankle of it. They removed the excelsior, placed Mrs. Williams's cat in the stocking, shook her down into the lower section of it, drew her feet through the four holes there, leaving her head in the toe of the stocking. Then, packed the excelsior down on top of her and once more attached the stocking to the rest of the long black snake. How shameful is the ease of the historian. He sits in his dressing gown to write, The enemy attacked in force. The tranquil pen, moving in a cloud of tobacco smoke, leaves upon the page its little hieroglyphics serenely summing up the monstrous deeds and sufferings of men of action. How cold to state merely that Penrod and the painted vermin succeeded in giving the long black snake a motive power or tractor, apparently its own, but consisting of Mrs. Williams's cat. She was drowsy when they lifted her from the box. She was still drowsy when they introduced part of her into the orifice of the stocking. But she woke to full, vigorous young life, when she perceived that their purpose was for her to descend into the black depths of that stocking head first. Vermin held the mouth of the stocking stretched, and Penrod manipulated the cat, but she left her hearty mark on both of them before, in a moment of unfortunate inspiration, she humped her back while she was upside down, and Penrod took advantage of the concavity to increase it even more than she desired. The next instant she was assisted downward into the gloomy interior, with Excelsior already beginning to block the means of egress. Gymnastic moments followed. There were times when both boys hurled themselves full length upon the floor, seizing the animated stocking with far-extended hands. And even when the snake was a complete thing, with legs growing from its unquestionably ugly face, either Penrod or Vermin must keep a grasp upon it, for it would not be soothed and refused over and over to calm itself, even when addressed as, Poor Kitty! A nice little kitty. Finally, they thought they had their good old snake about quieted down, as Penrod said, because the animated head had remained in one place for an unusual length of time, though the legs produced a rather sinister effect of crouching, and a noise like a distant planing mill came from the interior, and then Duke appeared in the doorway. He was still feeling lively. Chapter 18 The Departing Guest By the time Penrod returned from chasing Duke to the next corner, Vermin had the long black snake down from the rafter where its active head had taken refuge, with the rest of it dangling, and both boys agreed that Mrs. Williams's cat must certainly be able to see some anyway, through the meshes of the stocking. Well said Penrod. It's getting pretty near dark. What with all this bother and mess we've been having around here, and I expect as soon as I get this good old broom handle fixed out of the rake for you, Vermin, it'll be about time to begin what we had to go 
and take all this trouble for? Mr. Schofield had brought an old friend home to dinner with him. Dear old Joe Gilling, he called this friend, when introducing him to Mrs. Schofield. Mr. Gilling, as Mrs. Schofield was already informed by telephone, had just happened to turn up in town that day and had called on his classmate at the latter's office. The two had not seen each other in eighteen years. Mr. Gilling was a tall man, clad highly in the mode, and brought to a polished and powdered finish by barber and manicurist, but his colour was peculiar, being almost unhumanly florid, and, as Mrs. Schofield afterward claimed to have noticed, his eyes wore a nervous, apprehensive look. His hands were tremulous, and his manner was queer and jerky. At least, that is how she defined it. She was not surprised to hear him state that he was travelling for his health and not upon business. He had not been really well for several years, he said. At that, Mr. Schofield laughed and slapped him heartily on the back. Oh, mercy, Mr. Gilling cried, leaping in his chair. What is the matter? Nothing, Mr. Schofield laughed. I just slapped you the way we used to slap each other on the campus. What I was going to say was that you have no business being a bachelor. With all your money and nothing to do but travel and sit around hotels and clubs, no wonder you've grown bilious. Oh, no, I'm not bilious, Mr. Gilling said uncomfortably. I'm not bilious at all. You ought to get married, Mr. Schofield returned. You ought... He paused, for Mr. Gilling had jumped again. What's the trouble, Joe? Nothing. I thought perhaps... Perhaps you were going to slap me on the back again. Not this time, Mr. Schofield said, renewing his laughter. Well, is dinner about ready? He asked, turning to his wife. Where are Margaret and Penrod? Margaret's just come in. Mrs. Schofield answered. She'll be down in a minute, and Penrod's around somewhere. Penrod? Mr. Gilling repeated curiously in his nervous, serious way. What is Penrod? And at this, Mrs. Schofield joined in her husband's laughter. Mr. Schofield explained. Penrod's our young son, he said. He's not much for looks, maybe, but he's been pretty good lately, and sometimes we're almost inclined to be proud of him. You'll see him in a minute, old Joe. Old Joe saw him even sooner. Instantly, as Mr. Schofield finished his little prediction, the most shocking uproar ever heard in that house burst forth in the kitchen. Distinctly, Irish shrieks unlimited came from that quarter, together with the clashing of hurled metal and tin, the appealing sound of breaking china, and the hysterical barking of a dog. The library door flew open, and Mrs. Cullen appeared as a mingled streak, crossing the room from one door to the other. She was followed by a boy with a coal-black nose, and between his feet, as he entered, there appeared a big, long, black, horrible snake with frantic legs springing from what appeared to be its head, and it further fulfilled Mrs. Cullen's description by making a fizzin noise. Accompanying the snake, and still faithfully endeavouring to guide it with the detached handle of a rake, was a small black demon with a ghastly white forehead and ghastlier white hair. Duke, evidently still feeling his bath, was doing all in his power to aid the demon in making the snake step lively. A few kitchen implements followed this fugitive procession through the library doorway. The long black snake became involved with a leg of the heavy table in the centre of the room. The head developed spasms of agility. There were clangings and rippings. Then the foremost section of the long black snake detached itself, bounded into the air, and, after turning a number of somersaults, became severally a torn stocking, excelsior, and a lunatic cat. The ears of this cat were laid back flat upon its head, and its speed was excessive upon a fairly circular track it laid out for itself in the library. Flying round this orbit, it perceived the open doorway, passed through it, thence to the kitchen, and outward and onward. Della, having left the kitchen door open in her haste, as she retired to the backyard. The black demon, with the ghastly white forehead and hair, 
finding himself in the presence of grown people who were white all over, turned in his tracks and followed Mrs. Williams's cat to the great outdoors. Duke preceded Vermin. Mrs. Cullen vanished. Of the apparition, only wreckage and a rightfully apprehensive penrod were left. But where, Mrs. Schofield began, a few minutes later, looking suddenly mystified, where, where, where what, Mr. Schofield asked testily. What are you talking about? His nerves were jarred, and he was rather hoarse after what he had been saying to Penrod. That regretful necromancer was now upstairs doing unhelpful things to his nose over a washstand. What do you mean by where, where, where? Mr. Schofield demanded. I don't see any sense to it. But where is your old classmate? she cried. Where's Mr. Gilling? She was the first to notice this striking absence. By George! Mr. Schofield exclaimed. Where is old Joe? Margaret intervened. You mean that tall, pale man who was calling? she asked. Pale, no, said her father. He's as flushed as— He was pale when I saw him, Margaret said. He had his hat and coat, and he was trying to get out of the front door when I came running downstairs. He couldn't work the catch for a minute, but before I got to the foot of the steps, he managed to turn it and open the door. He went out before I could think what to say to him. He was in such a hurry. I guess everything was so confused you didn't notice. But he's certainly gone. Mrs. Schofield turned to her husband. But I thought he was going to stay to dinner, she cried. Mr. Schofield shook his head, admitting himself flawed. Later, having mentally gone over everything that might shed light on the curious behaviour of old Joe, he said, without preface, he wasn't at all dissipated when we were in college. Mrs. Schofield nodded severely. Maybe this was just the best thing could have happened to him after all, she said. It may be, her husband returned. I don't say it isn't. But that isn't going to make any difference in what I'm going to do to Penrod.